Well, good morning. Glad that you here this morning. You've joined us at Grace. Uh, we have been in a series since pretty much since we've opened the ministry center, and it's called Firm Foundation, which we've been looking at the essential beliefs that we hold as Christians, and we've we've covered a variety of topics. And today we have quite literally reached the end. So we are talking about the end. And uh, it is also the last, it is the end of the series as well. But uh, this is the finale, so to speak. Just to recap kind of where we've been, kind of see the forest as we, as we head into this last message. We started several months back about the eternal God and how he created everything. And this God had no beginning, but yet he is the beginning of, of everything else. And our God, he is so unique. He is so complex in the sense that he is this triune God, meaning he's one God, but three eternal persons, a Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And within this community, there is this eternal love. There is loving communion. There is joyful fellowship. There is this mutual serving of one another, this dynamic God of love, this eternal God of love. And God's love is so great, so abundant. He wanted to share that love. It's not because he was needy. It's not because he was lonely. He's that loving. He wants to share. And so he creates. And he created humanity, you and me, to know him, to experience that love that he has had for eternity. But Humanity rebelled against God, rejected that relationship with Him, and therefore we cut ourselves off from the source of life and the due penalty of that, which is sin, is death, separation from God. But praise God, that is not the end of the story. As Ephesians 2 says, that God is rich in mercy. And so He sent forth a Savior who we know is Jesus, as Michael just prayed and said, his name means Yahweh saves. And so this Jesus is fully God and yet also fully human, made like you and me, and he lived a perfectly obedient life, so he had no sin. But yet he was declared guilty in a human court and he was crucified. But this death, as Jesus said multiple times, before it happened, that this was not an accident. This was purposeful. This is meaningful. This was a sacrifice. His death was for the forgiveness of our sin, that sin that separated us from God, that broke that relationship with him. Jesus came for that very reason to mend that, to restore that. And he did that by taking our place, taking our sin upon himself and giving us forgiveness. We celebrated on on Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, Jesus Christ was raised from the dead, establishing our righteous status before God and giving us eternal life. And then we believe in Christ. We are given the gift of the Holy Spirit, who is also a, a member of the triune God, the one God of three persons who dwells in us and begins this work of transformation to help us all become more like Jesus. That we join his church, the people and family of God who are redeemed from every tribe, nation, and tongue. And we are called to love and to serve God's people, his church, and to proclaim to the world, to others, about this most incredible news, about the most incredible Savior who can give them, in this lost and dying world, life. And that's our task to the end. And so today we're looking at where is everything headed? What is the end? History is not just this endless loop of things. History has an end. God has a finale. And even though we're going to use, I'm going to use the word end today, there is really no true end as we'll see. What I mean and what we mean by end is the end of the way things are right now. That's the end we're talking about. Because what comes after the end is something new. And for believers, 
That's the best part. Eternal life with God. So our main point this morning is, we believe Christ shall return. He will establish his eternal kingdom. And we who believe in him shall enjoy everlasting life. So we're going to look at what's, what's coming up. So the first is the final coming of Christ, also called the second coming of Christ. This is the next really major event that Jesus is going to return. Now, we know he was born, he lived, he died, he rose from the grave, he ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father. What's coming next is Jesus is going to return. Now, this return, he's not coming this time as a helpless baby. He's not coming to be crucified. He is coming to return in the glory and power of God to establish the fullness of God's kingdom. The first time he came to save us from our sins, the second time or the final time, he's not going to come a third, a fourth, a fifth. The final time he comes is to bring an end to the way things are right now. You see, as Michael said, we live in this dark world. We live in a world that is affected by sin. We, we're under the tyranny of sin. In this land of death and brokenness. And Jesus is coming to banish sin, all sin, and to destroy death. A couple of verses this morning, 1 Thessalonians 4.16, speaking about the Lord's return and then what happens with the dead. He says, For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Jesus here defeating death. The dead will rise. There's going to be a general resurrection for all those who have perished. 1 Corinthians 15, 24 through 26 says, Then comes the end. When Jesus, he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. And then verse 26, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. This great enemy of death is destroyed. And believers, we get to experience everlasting life. To never die again. This is what Jesus is coming to bring, to banish sin and to destroy death forever. Now, this is all exciting. The question is, when is this going to happen? It's been 2,000 years since Jesus was born, lived, died, resurrected, ascended to heaven. Has he forgotten? Where is he? Why hasn't he returned yet? Well, it's important that Jesus talks about this timing he talks about a delay. He talks about this in, in various places, but we'll read it from Mark 13. He's talking about his second coming, his final coming. He says, Then they, really the world, will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. That's how he's going to return. With great power and glory. And he will send out the angels. And he will gather his elect, his people, from the four winds, from the ends of earth to the ends of heaven. He won't miss a single believer. He's coming to gather his people. He's coming in great power and glory. But verse 32 of Mark 13, but concerning that day or that hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Verse 33, so what do we should do in light of that? Be on guard. Keep awake. For you do not know when the time will come. We don't know. We know he's going to return. We know he's coming in the great glory and power to take his people. But we don't know when it's going to happen. And so we should definitely be highly, highly skeptical and reject any claims that people might have. And there are, a, a, you know, decent amount of people out there, that know exactly when it's going to happen. Do you hear that? Reject that. No one knows when it's going to happen. Now, I attended Biola University basically from 2011 to 2013. And um, during this time, maybe you remember this, I mean, it, in the L.A. region at least, there was a lot of money spent 
and I know I'm going to call his name out, by Harold Camping. He spent a lot of money. There are billboards all over the L.A. region talking about the end of the world. And, and it wasn't just a general, hey, the world's ending, repent, believe in Jesus. No, it was very specific when the end of the world was going to happen. It was May 21st, 2011. That was Judgment Day. That's, that was, it was all over L.A., billboards, end of the world, May 21st, 2011. So I don't know, I'm just going to say, I had a research paper, it was beyond that date, I don't know when it was. So I'm driving around, I'm looking at billboards saying, the world is going to end. That is not motivating for me to do that research paper, because I'm like, well, what if he's right? I mean... He knows something I don't. I don't know. He spent a lot of money on that. Well, I'm glad that I did the research paper. I stayed in school because May 22nd, obviously it happened. But did he, uh, did he apologize? Did he take it back? No, he doubled down. He said that, no, actually what happened was a spiritual judgment happened, but the real deal was five months in the future. It's October 21st, 2011. Great, right? I think on the billboard, they just like plaster it over it. Okay, new date. And it's like, okay, now do I even go back to school in the fall? Okay. Okay, again, I'm glad I did because October 22nd happened. And this too was wrong. And then to his credit, I must give him credit, he later admitted what he did was wrong, sinful, and foolish. That no one knows the day. And I know it's easy to pick on someone like that. But even the great Protestant reformer, Martin Luther, he couldn't help himself by saying, he says this, he says, I hope the last day of judgment is not far. We're right with you on that one, Martin Luther. But he says, I persuade myself verily. Okay, he wrote a long time ago, so this is weird English. I persuade myself verily. It will not be absent full 300 years longer. Basically saying within 300 years, Jesus is going to return. Martin Luther wrote in 1540. So by 1840, Jesus was supposed to return. Well, he didn't at least give an exact year and didn't do billboards, but he was still dreadfully wrong. So what we need to do is hear really the wisdom that Peter says in 2 Peter 3, 8 through 10. He says, but do not overlook this one fact, beloved. I'm going to read that again. Do not overlook this one fact. It's a pretty important fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years. And a thousand years is as one day. What? I mean, time is relative. Time is different to God. A thousand years could be, wow, one day. Or it could be a, one day is a thousand years. It's just the time of God's timeline is, is far different than ours. The way we experience time and the way God does is far different. So verse 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, so unexpectedly. Then the heavens will pass away with a roar, and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved, and the earth and all the works that are done on it will be exposed. So don't let this time, I know it's been 2,000 years. Is, is he coming again? Has he forgotten? Where is, where is he? Don't let the time discourage you. Because this God who makes promises, as, as Peter says, he is not slow to fulfill his promise. He will return. The God who makes promises will fulfill them. This is why when we, we celebrate Christmas every year, we celebrate the fact that God made promises a long time ago about the coming Messiah. And guess what? On every Christmas, we get to celebrate that God fulfills his promise. Well, so too here. We haven't seen the second coming yet, but we know he will come. We just don't know when that's going to be. But take heed of what Jesus says in Mark 13, verse 33. He says, stay awake. Be expectant of his coming. Because he will come. 
And I know, we, look, we can chuckle at those predictions because they are really wrong. But at least they're longing and looking for the coming of Christ. At least they took it serious. They believe Jesus is going to return. The question for us this morning is, do you believe Jesus is going to come back? Do you believe Jesus is returning? Do you believe that it could even be today? Do we long for his coming? Do we even look for it? Or is that just some, yeah, yeah, I guess he'll come. Or maybe you don't even believe he'll come. Look, Luther got it wrong, no doubt. But I love this quote. He says, preach and live as if Jesus was crucified yesterday. He rose from the dead today and he's returning tomorrow. What if that was our perspective? Jesus died yesterday. It's so fresh in our mind. He rose this morning. The greatest news is that Jesus overcame death. He conquered it. Our sins are forgiven. And then the urgency is he's coming back tomorrow. He's coming back tomorrow. You know, it's not like, yeah, I'll live for Christ, but yeah, that's, I'll do it when I'm like 60 or something. You know, I'm going to do it when I'm 80. I'm going to, what are we waiting for? He could return. We don't know when he's going to return. So live for Christ today. Proclaim the good news of our risen Savior today. Because we know he will return. And when he does, that's the end of history as we know it. And the start of something new. Point two, what's, that, what's coming up after this, the final coming is final judgment. Now, this is a topic everyone wants to talk about, but judgment of God towards sinful humanity is about as common of a theme as you'll find in the Old and New Testament. This is about as a clear of teaching and doctrine that you can hold in the Bible. This is everywhere. So the Old Testament, I'll just give one example. It's a good one. It's a book that you all probably read all the time. It's called Zephaniah. That's in the Bible, I promise. Zephaniah 1, 17 through 18. This is, a, this is a doozy. Okay. He says, I will bring distress on mankind, so they shall walk like the blind, because they have sinned against the Lord. Their blood shall be poured out like dust, their flesh like dung. Neither their silver nor their gold shall be able to deliver them on the day of wrath of the Lord and the fire of his jealousy. All the earth shall be consumed for a full and sudden end he will make of all the inhabitants of the earth. Yeah, you're not, you won't find that verse in like a Bible bookstore home decor section, but you will, you will find verses like that all over the Old Testament. And I know you might, you know, don't go to the caricature that that's just the Old Testament angry God. Because let's go New Testament. It's going to sound pretty similar. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 9. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might. Look, old and new. Like, it doesn't matter. This is God's word. This is his scripture. God's wrath towards sinful humanity is clear truth. It's not a matter of if God's going to judge the world. It's a matter of when he's going to judge the world. And what makes this a final judgment is this is the end of sin. This is the final accounting of all human evil and sin. There's no more judgment after this. This is the final rendering of all judgment that will ever be made again. Now, why does God wait to the end? Well, he waits to the end because of something that we're all familiar with called a ripple effect. Like, I guess I was, I did this when I was a kid, I'm told. I threw rocks in a lake for hours. I don't know why. I just like throwing rocks. Well, you know when you throw a rock into water, it makes a big splash, right? But then that's not all that happens. There is the ripple effect. We're all familiar with this. The biggest splash, obviously, is going to be nearest the stone. But that's not the only effect the stone has. It has that ripple effect, and that goes far and wide. 
Well, human sin acts in very similar ways. Sure, the biggest splash is going to be nearest the vicinity of the act. But that's not the only impact that that sin has. Sin has ripple effects. And human choices can affect people generations later. I mean, there are people maybe in your life that you've never even met, but guess what? They've affected your life with the choices that they've made. And that can be the same for us. What we do today can affect generations years down the line because this thing called a ripple effect. It does that. It exists. And so final judgment, it makes sense that it's at the end because God wants to take into account the widest ripple effect that sin can have. He wants to take into account every ounce of harm, every ounce of evil that humans have done. Because God is a really good and righteous God, and he wants to get it absolutely perfectly right. And therefore, he has to take into account the full measure of what the sin has done. And so he brings true justice to the fullest measure. And that's final judgment. And that's why it's at the end. Now, I know final judgment can really conjure up fear. But this is part of the amazing good news that Christians have is final judgment for the believer in Christ does not need to be something you fear. It should not be something you fear. If you fear final judgment, you need to preach the gospel to yourself again because you have forgotten the greatest news is that we have been saved from the wrath and judgment of God by Jesus Christ. There is nothing, there is nothing that the believer needs to fear because our judgment has already been rendered. On the cross of Christ, he took the penalty of our sin, our past, our present, our future sin upon himself. Jesus died for that, to forgive us of all the wrongdoing that we have done. And so in Christ, you are forgiven, we are made righteous, we are clean. He took the penalty, the wrath and separation of God so that we wouldn't have to. As Romans 8, 1 says, there's now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. It's only for those that are in Christ Jesus. But if you're in Christ Jesus, there's no condemnation for you. There's no guilty verdict on your life. And so at final judgment, what will happen is we will be declared innocent before him. As Psalm 103, it says that it removes our sin as far as the east is from the west. Because Jesus presents you and me before the final judgment, on the final day of accounting, as holy and blameless before him. Ephesians 5. I know this is usually used in marriage stuff, but this can easily apply to final judgment. Look at Ephesians 5, 25 through 27. Christ loved the church. That's us, right? Christ loved the church that he gave himself for her that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church, present the church on final judgment day to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Again, if you fear final judgment, read this passage, apply it to yourself by the blood of Jesus. You are cleansed. He gave himself for you, which means he died for our sin. So that, why? So that he could sanctify us, make us holy, make us righteous. That not even, there's not even a spot or wrinkle, not even a little sin left. It is completely washed away. And so Christ saves us. This is the gospel, right? The good news. He saves us from the wrath of God. And it only gets better because then he saves us to the joy of eternal life. Our third and final point is the final, the final eternal state. So it's, it's through final judgment that humanity is separated. And it's really as simple as this. We are separated into two camps. We either into eternal life also could be called heaven, or we experience, we enter into eternal death, also called hell. Both are final, 
Both are eternal states. There's no going back. There's no going between. Once the final judgment is rendered, that is it. That is final. That is eternal. Jesus teaches this in Matthew 25, 31. He says, when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. And before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people from one another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father. Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Verse 41. But he'll say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And I know, look, eternal death and hell, this is not a subject, it's uncomfortable for many. And it should be. Because we don't want anyone to go into eternal death. And neither does God. And that's why he warns us about it. That's why he tells us about what could happen if you reject him. What will happen if you reject him? God warns us. Because as Peter said, he, God wishes that no one should perish. And God showed us abundantly how clear it is. How do you, what's the way of salvation? How am I to be saved? God shows that too because he wants all to receive salvation. And so yeah, hell is a doctrine we have to teach and preach, but it's a doctrine that we preach with tears in our eyes because we, like God, want no one to perish. We want no one to enter into eternal death, but we want all to experience eternal life. But as C.S. Lewis, he, he has, this is how he describes what hell is. He says, hell is a place where the doors are locked from the inside. Meaning is that if we reject Jesus in this life, we're given what we want eternally. If you reject Jesus, if you don't want God in your life, then you're given that forever. You don't have God in your life forever. But how to be saved is also made abundantly clear. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. There is only one way of entering heaven. There's only one way of entering and experiencing salvation. And Jesus says this in, in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He is the only way that we can experience eternal life. And I know the big misconception is that how do you, salvation is earned, basically. The misconception is that God is on our final judgment day. He's going to weigh our good versus our bad. And if our good outweigh the bad, then we enter eternal life. But that is the worst lie. Because that's not how final judgment will be rendered. It's do you believe in Jesus? Is Jesus your salvation or not? Heaven is not earned. Heaven is not a reward for the righteous. Our works do not save us. The only thing works do is they, just, they demonstrate our faith in Christ. And that's what saves us alone, is our faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the only way to experience salvation. And so that's good news for all of us who've given our life to Jesus, because that means we have eternal security in Christ. Because if it was on us, if it was on, is it the stacking of the good and versus bad? then you'll get to your death day and you will have that same question in your head, have I done enough? Have I done enough good? And you'll never have peace in this life. You'll never have joy in this life because you'll be anxious knowing, I, I don't know if I've done enough good. But if you know that Christ is enough and that by him you are saved in him alone, then you can know peace and joy in this life because it's not on you, but it's on him who is sufficient, who has saved us, who has forgiven us. And on final judgment day, he will look at us and see the righteousness of Jesus and declare us innocent and to inherit the eternal kingdom forever. So what's, what's eternal life like? Well, like I said, it's the end of the way things are now, but it's a new beginning. 
Revelation 21, verses 1 through 5. He says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who is seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. And also he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. I love that last part. Write this down, because these words are trustworthy and true. This is the future. This is our glorious future. That the way of sin, of death, of pain, of suffering, of loss, they're gone. Those belong to the former things. But the new has come. And this dwelling place with God, this is what we were created for. This is what we were made for, to know and to have this eternal relationship of love, the fullness of joy, which our sin has separated us from that. But Jesus has saved us, and now this is the fullest fruit of our salvation, our future here. Heaven is seeing our Savior face to face, no longer having that separation, wiping away every tear, every hurt that we've ever experienced in this life, and only now forever will be the fullness of joy. And there are some joys on earth, but they're like a little candle light compared to the joys of eternal life, which is like the noonday sun. No comparison. So the question is, as we wrap up this message and really this series, is what should we do now? Well, the urge is to live now in light of eternity, our sure and secure future. Because it's going to come soon. You know, I recently, I got to watch someone die and enter into the joys of eternal life. Uh, He was a believer who sang, quite literally, he sang praises as he died. He was my grandfather. Uh, He died 95 years young. (laughs) He died only a few weeks ago. He was here and well on Easter Sunday. He fell and broke his hip Monday, and he died on Friday. That's, that's how quick it can happen. But while he lay dying, I got to read him a variety of passages from Scripture, and I actually read him Revelation 21, and it, was, it stuck out of my mind because it's the only passage he actually made a verbal comment to. You know, as we're talking about the future hope, a place of no pain, of no crying, of no death, my grandpa, after reading it, he said, that's a good passage. Yes, Grandpa, that's a, that's a good passage. And we sang hymns. We sang about the faithfulness of God. We sang about the greatness of God. We sang about his amazing grace. As he's dying, as he has this broken hip, yet he's filled with joy. He's filled with hope, praising God as he's looking to our future, to our hope, as he's about to enter into that. Well, in that moment, you know, the things of this world, they're no longer important. It's what laid ahead in eternity. That's what most mattered. And so when he entered into eternity, I know, I know what he's doing right now. He is singing and dancing with joy. And he has no regrets. But thinking back on it, you know, you don't, you don't just get to your deathbed and sing praises of God by accident. You know, my grandpa probably didn't know it, but he prepared for that hour every single day of his life because he pursued a relationship with our loving Savior. He rejoiced in our Savior. And if you ever saw him at church, you know he sang praises to God with fullness of joy. So when he's dying, it's no different than any other day. 
And the question for us is when, it, when it's our turn. Because it will be. When we're the ones dying, we'll, we'll be singing as we enter into eternity. The answer to that question is how we live out each day. How we live now shapes our hearts, forms our hopes, and shows where our treasure is. So live now in light of eternity, our most glorious, blessed future. For it will be here sooner than you think. I'm going to close in prayer, and uh, after our final song, we'll be up here to pray. If you have not given your life to Jesus, if you don't know the joy of being forgiven, of having this glorious future, of receiving eternal life, we invite you to come forward to pray with us after we sing our final song. And we open up to anyone who needs prayer for any other thing. We'll be here. We want to pray with you and for you. Let me close in prayer, and then we're going to, we're going to finish with a song. We're going to practice what we'll be doing for all eternity. Pray with me. Father, thank you so much. Oh, Lord, we are so grateful. Because death is not the end. Because our sin hasn't won. But the good news of Jesus Christ is that we are forgiven, that we are saved, and that we have a glorious eternal future with you. Lord, thank you. Lord, I, I, we know, we know we can get distracted in this world. But Lord, help us to be so tethered to your heart, so tethered to your word, so tethered to your glorious future that you reveal to us that we live differently in this world. That we're filled with hope, that we're filled with joy, that we're not easily distracted by the things of this world, but our hope and joy are placed upon you and experiencing eternal life with you forever. Lord, we're so grateful that you would give us such a gift for people who are not worthy and not deserving of it. So Lord, use whatever, how many hours or minutes or days or years, whatever breath we have in our lungs, use it for you. That we would praise you, glorify you, live for you today, tomorrow, and forever. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.